You were just talking a little earlier, and you did this in the book, uh, and I don't mean to start parochial in Chicago, but the world does revolve around Chicago, so. Uh, <laughs> You talk about, in the book, about your mother yes. uh, and her struggles. You talk about, uh, just as you did as Merchandise Mart, if I can't say a plug, your fa this is not your father's Merchandise Mart anymore. The first top, the top five floors are all high tech. Speak a little about Park Ridge, your mother's struggles, your father as a small businessman, and how those values were, became your North Star or not, as you literally go from Chicago to Arkansas, Arkansas to the White House, to the Senate, and then on to the world stage? Well, Chicago was absolutely the center of our universe. And for obvious reasons, not only that I was born in Chicago, but my mother was born in Chicago. She was born to uh, very young parents who were not prepared to be parents. And she suffered a lot of uh, just plain old-fashioned neglect and uh, abuse. And she had a younger sister, and eventually her young parents uh, divorced, and neither of them wanted the girls. And they foisted them off on uh, my mother's father's uh, parents, who were these two very severe uh, characters who uh, lived in California. And if you can believe it, this is the first time I really had any insight into how different my mother's life was from my life. So in order just to get rid of the girls, um, her parents put them alone on the train here in Chicago. My mother was seven, her sister was five, and sent them off to California all by themselves. They arrived safely, thankfully, um, but then it was a miserable existence. Her grandmother was particularly harsh and would punish my mother for the slightest infraction. And my mother loved school, and she loved her friends. And one of the worst stories that I learned much later in life is that her grandmother forbade my mother from going out trick-or-treating one Halloween. And, you know, she was like an 11-year-old girl, and so she snuck out her bedroom window and met up with her friends and... Unfortunately, when they were running through the dark, she fell and she hit her knee on a stone and she had to go to the emergency room of the hospital, but that's how her grandmother found out. So her grandmother kept her in her room, let her out to go to school, but nothing else for more than a year. Eventually, my mother said to herself, this is no way to live, and she had enough resilience and enough imagination and intelligence to understand that there had to be a better life out there than to be neglected and abandoned by your parents and mistreated by your grandparents. So she got a job as a, a live-in au pair with a family uh, in the area. She was 13 years old, and she made this uh, deal. She got room and board, very little, if any, money. But she had to take care of the children, get them up in the morning, get them fed, get them off to school. Then she could go to school as long as she got back in time to meet them and feed them and take care of them. But she saw for the first time a family that actually cared about their children. And there was love in the house, not hate and fear and anxiety and irresponsibility. But her birth mother was still living in Chicago. So my mother graduates from high school where she ended up doing very well. And she really wanted to go to college. Uh, and at that time, California had a really superb higher education system, and it was very cheap for people who lived in California. And that's what my mother was thinking about doing. And then her mother contacted her for the first time in years and said, oh, no, if you come to Chicago, we'll send you to college in Chicago. And, you know, there's always a desire that maybe you can reconcile with somebody who abandoned you, especially your mother. So my mother took that train back to Chicago only to find out once again that her mother basically wanted her to be her housekeeper and never intended to send her to college. So my mother went out on her own, became a secretary. Meantime, my father graduated from college in Penn State. He was a football player, and as he had said many times, it was the only reason he really got to go to school, because he could play football. And he gets out in the middle of the Depression, and he's looking for a job, and he can't find any. And then he hears about some job for, for salespeople 
in the Midwest. And he, he literally hops a freight train, gets to Chicago, gets a job selling in the Midwest, and ends up working for a company where my mother was employed. And then when they got married and then Pearl Harbor happened, my father was in the Navy, he was assigned to Great Lakes. So Chicago is at the real core of my family, who we are, where we come from. I was born at the old, no longer existing Edgewater Beach Hospital. And we lived in that neighborhood until my father saved up enough money because he didn't believe in debt. He never had a credit card. He instilled that probably to a fault in me, I suppose. But he saved up enough money so that he could go buy a house in Park Ridge. We moved there when I was four, and, and that's where we lived and, and went to school until my parents got to much older and couldn't manage it any longer. Those are just your kindergarten years. <laughs> <laughs> we just got to the age of four. <laughs> so I've been reading a lot about uh, the kickoff of the book tour. Uh, Hillary, uh, dead broke. Really? Well, oh. <laughs> that may have not been the most artful way yeah. uh, of saying that, you know, Bill and I have gone through a lot of different phases in our, our lives. Uh, that was then. This is now. And obviously we are very fortunate uh, we've been given great opportunities. I had a wonderful public school education when I was in Park Ridge. Uh, my husband, who was much less uh, well off even uh, uh, than you know, most people I knew growing up, also had great teachers, great education. So we've been blessed, and we have gone through ups and downs like a lot of people, but you know, clearly we're very grateful for the opportunities we've had. In the book, uh, you talk about economic statecraft. And uh, President Clinton always said that, you know, the world's not binary anymore. There isn't foreign policy and there isn't economic policy, and they're two separate buckets. And economic statecraft is exactly that kind of imprint. Talk about how those two worlds combine and how, people, how to get folks to understand that it's not somewhere off distant, but it's close to home, and what's close to home impacts somewhere off distance. Well, Ram, thank you for raising it. I'm not surprised you would because, you know, when I was writing the book and I, I said I wanted to write a whole chapter about economics and about the need for the United States to compete in the global economy and for our government to support our businesses and our workers. Um, you know, my, my editor and others said, well, you know, are people really going to be interested in that? And I said, well, I don't know, but it was an important part of what I did um, because when I was a senator, I represented New York, which is not dissimilar from Illinois in that there are parts of the state that were booming, particularly in New York City and the environs, but there were a lot of places in the agricultural upstate area or in the older industrial cities that were really struggling. And I believed strongly that we needed to have everybody on the playing field to work to make sure it was level for American uh, business uh, and jobs. And therefore, as a senator, I saw firsthand how difficult it was for a lot of American businesses to be treated fairly in other markets. Perfect example, obviously, is China. Um, big, great American company called Corning from Corning, New York, was being discriminated against. I went to bat for them. But I needed to get the help of the then uh, George W. Bush administration, and I just couldn't get it because their attitude was un very dissimilar from what you, know, you remember you and Bill and everybody was doing in the 90s. You know, if an American business wanted help, you guys pulled the stops out and did everything you could. But I was basically told, you know, we, we don't put our finger on the scale. This is the global economy, the free market. I said, yeah, but you're not competing against a free market. China is not a free market. It's a state-owned enterprise from start to finish. Our companies should not be disadvantaged. And I talked with President Bush at the Clinton Library opening in the torrential rainstorm we were all enduring. And I said, Mr. President, I need your help. And to his, you know, his credit, he said yes. So I came into the office of Secretary of State realizing that the United States had to stand up for American business and American workers. And that's what I tried to do. It was my way of contributing to increasing exports, increasing investment that would help us get out of this economic uh, disaster we were in the midst of. And, Ram, I think it's as true today, even if times were booming, which they're not, we would still have to be doing this because we can't let other countries tilt their economic system in favor of their companies against our companies. And it's something I feel very strongly about and, and believe that uh, we have to be smarter about uh, 
uh, what we do in what I call economic statecraft. Let me uh, take that question and then try to put it in a little away from the book, but put it into current context. Uh, Europe last week had elections, and in the EU, you had this kind of populist moment. You've had a couple elections here in the United States, uh, in Mississippi, just one last night with a Tea Party uh, person toppling Eric Cantor, and you have this kind of anti-establishment elections, and yet governing with this kind of anti-establishment, populist strain, whatever term you want to use. So how do you, as a progressive, a pragmatic uh, leader, how do you govern in a moment of angst and being that angst coming out in this kind of populist electoral response? You're seeing Chile, Europe, some elements of it here in the United States. How do you put those two worlds governing and what's happening in the electoral policy into a uh, coherent whole, if, it, if it's possible even? Well, it, it is and it must be, because otherwise I fear that we will undermine uh, the great advantages we have, uh, because there isn't any country better equipped to be successful in the 21st century. But you're absolutely right, Ram. The, the mood... I don't out- often get that at home. You're absolutely <laughs> right. So the, we're going to redo this again. No, uh, I hope nobody's recording Three teenagers it. at home, you never get that. <laughs> well, Tell me it's the other way around, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> well, that probably is true. But anyway, we'll go on. Um, but... but there is a, a sense of anxiety, despair, disappointment, even anger in a lot of democracies, because that's what we're talking about, where people have played by the rules, as my husband famously used to say, and they used to get ahead, and their kids used to do even better, but now people doubt that that's going to happen. So this is not just about the economy. This is about our democracy. We have to do a much better job in setting forth the goals that we are pursuing on behalf of our country and then connect them to the real changes in people's lives. Mm-hmm. You know, income inequality is a real problem. I, mean, I don't have anything against success. I'm all for it. But it is not enough because that is not what made this country successful. You know, you can find rich people anywhere in the world But you could never find what we built here in the 20th century, which was a broad-based middle class that thrived on inclusive prosperity and innovation and entrepreneurial uh, energy. We've got to get back to that. So I'm pretty old-fashioned about this, Ram. I think you have to be explicit about what it is you're trying to achieve. You have to bring people along. It has to be a constant conversation with the American people. And you have to be, you know, very clearly rebutting the kinds of critiques uh, and alternatives that are ideologically based, that have nothing to do with evidence. You know, I think the debate should be over in this country. Trickle-down economics does not work. Bill Clinton proved that 1,000 percent. And and what what we have now is too much policy being made in what I call an evidence-free zone. You know, whatever sounds good, whatever the lowest common denominator is. And I I do think that this is not just a job for government, for political leaders, elected uh, people like yourself. We've got to get the rest of the country involved in this. We have to rebuild the consensus for the American dream in America. And I think it's eminently doable and absolutely necessary. Let me... uh... Take everybody back uh, two moments. One, when you went to China, spoke about women's rights. Three years ago in Geneva, about the importance of gay rights as a human rights issue. And I would also say that uh, this week was, came online that here in the, we obviously passed six months ago, marriage equality. Uh, <laughs> Illinois. Uh, okay, Illinois is no longer gay marriage or straight marriage. It's just marriage, and that's a, a first. But you as a leader, or as a first lady in any way, you're about to go speak, and do you challenge the authority? How, what, how do you use that role? When do you use it? So in both cases, you basically said, I'm going to break the eggshells. Uh, we're not going to be uh, silent on things that are core to us. So put people in that set before you go to an international setting, right. whether you speak out, where you speak out, and how do you use that form? It's a great question because you're constantly trying to assess um, 
by speaking out, are you going to do more good than harm? Are you going to put people at risk, uh, or are you going to empower them? And in our country, uh, we, I think, sometimes take for granted the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression, uh, the right to stand up and be disagreeable if you so choose, uh, or to try to find some more uh, polite way to proceed. But we have such a vigorous debate in lots of places in the world, that's just not the case. When I went to China in 1995, first there was a big debate in our own government. People were worried in the White House, the State Department, elsewhere, that if I called out China or any other country, frankly... That would for, be a senior advisor in yeah, the White senior House. Yeah, senior advisor, anonymous sourced. Um, <laughs> like, oh what my gosh, jerk. there she goes again. <laughs> Can't you control your wife, Mr. President? Uh, <laughs> But anyway, President, I ended up nobody, going. nobody wants to talk to her. Can you talk to her, please? <laughs> <laughs> because this was the most important women's conference probably since Seneca Falls, uh, New York, back in uh, 1848. And I was determined to go and determined to speak out. And I'm very happy I did. The Chinese cut off the broadcast and tried to censor what I said, but it got through. But it was a very clear point, an argument that arises out of our values as Americans, which I believe are not just American values, but universal values. So fast forward, um, I continued my work on behalf of women and girls. I'm doing that at the Clinton Foundation to try to keep breaking uh, those ceilings. And, and when I got to the State Department, I made it very clear, and, and, the, and President Obama was absolutely with me on this, that Women and girls had to be not just a luxury or a nice issue when you could get to it, but central to our foreign policy. Because here's what we know. When women and girls are educated, have health care, participate in their economies, their societies, those countries are more stable. They're less likely to fall into conflict. They're less likely to breed extremism. You have many examples around the world that can make that point. But even now we know that where women can participate in the economy, the gross domestic product of these countries grows. So it's not just the right moral argument to make, which I was making in 95. I had a lot more ammunition to make this argument around the world and raised it everywhere I went and stood up for women's rights. At the same time, I was seeing an increasing uh, backlash against LGBT communities laws being passed that would criminalize behaviors, even leading potentially to the death penalty. And I began to vigorously protest with governments um, in many parts of the world. And some are, are just, they just need to be brought along. They truly are not well uh, informed. But some are just cynical, like what Putin's doing in Russia with all these laws against the LGBT community. That is just a cynical political ploy. I've had shouting matches with top Russian officials about this. But I realized that unless there was a, an argument made, a platform created like what I had tried to do in Beijing, we wouldn't have as strong a case to make. So that's why I went to Geneva and made a, made a speech uh, on behalf of gay rights and tried to put it into a context where uh, governments and activists and businesses and others would s begin to speak out against and try to protest. We have a long way to go. I don't want to mislead anybody. Uh, but we have some good examples. South Africa is a good example where you now have uh, laws on the books for equality. But this is going to be an ongoing struggle, and the United States must be on the front lines of the LGBT rights. Thank you. Uh, when you talk about all the issues, you led the fight in Arkansas, or chaired the governor's uh, commission on education reform. This Friday will be the first year here in the city of Chicago. Every child in every neighborhood will get universal kindergarten for the first time ever, full seven and a half hour day for every child. All the challenges you talk about and all the opportunities come through education. That school, was A, the, first, the front door of the home and the front door of the classroom. Talk about the role of education in kind of creating a 21st century economy that you're 
want to see for all middle class. Well, first, let me congratulate you and Chicago on getting to full day kindergarten for every child in the city, which is a very important um, step. Look, I, and what you said at the end, Ram, I, I believe 100% and should be trumpeted from the top of the Sears Tower. The... Uh, don't walk out until it's fixed on that platform, though. <laughs> the, the family is the child's first school. Yes. Parents and grandparents and siblings and others are a child's first teacher's. What we want to do is encourage and support families to understand what it takes to prepare that child to walk into the door of that full-day kindergarten or even into a a preschool uh, program. Uh, And and it has to be a partnership. So what you're trying to do and what so many leaders in our country are trying to do, which is to kind of bring our schools into the 21st century, Uh, We are in a competition, I referred to that earlier, uh, for opportunity, for our standard of living, for prosperity, for the American dream, and education is the base of everything we wish to accomplish. But I also think, and that's why when I got out of the State Department, I went to the Clinton Foundation and joined my husband, who did such a remarkable job starting it, and my daughter, who has been working there for a few years. I wanted to support all the great work that was being done, HIV, AIDS, drugs, and fighting obesity, uh, and helping farmers. I wanted to do all of that, but I wanted to bring three of my own initiatives, and one of them is called Too Small to Fail, and here's what it's about. It's about the word gap. Because on that first day of full-day kindergarten, one of Rom's kids, my future grandchild, uh, will enter kindergarten having heard 30 million more words than a child from a poor family. doesn't mean that we love our kids anymore. I believe that the vast majority of parents and families love their kids desperately and want to do the best they can for them. But often... Just getting that food on the table, keeping the rent paid with the roof over the head, that crowds out everything else. And yet now we know that talking, reading, and singing to your child, and the Harris family has been a great supporter of these kinds of programs as we sit here in the, yeah. in the Harris Theater. Um, we now know that it not only builds vocabulary, it builds brains. So I want a better partnership in communities helping families know that they're the most important first teachers, then providing the kind of educational opportunities starting in kindergarten that every single American child deserves to have. And that is our most important task because it's our kids that deserve every opportunity we can give them, but we know that education is the gateway to that opportunity. And so I applaud Chicago for getting this important first step But then I hope we can work with Chicago families so that families, no matter how poor or how uneducated or whether English is the first language or not, are talking, reading, and singing and building those brains and building those vocabularies so every child has the best chance to take advantage of that. First question uh, from the audience. What is uh, your biggest accomplishment in government and what is your biggest regret? Well, the biggest accomplishment in uh, the four years as Secretary of State uh, was helping to restore American leadership. And we did that in a number of ways. We did it specifically by putting together an international coalition to bring Iran to the negotiating table to see if there was a chance to try to prevent it from becoming a nuclear-armed country. We did it by passing a treaty through the Senate, uh, no easy matter these days, uh, to get back to inspecting (laughs) Russian missile Uh, sites and lowering the number of uh, nuclear weapons in Russia and the United States. We did it by making it very clear we were going to stand up for peace in the Middle East, and I was able to engineer three face-to-face meetings between Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas, and as I write in detail in the book, it wasn't successful, but we never stopped trying, and of course, Secretary Kerry uh, also has done his best. But then stopping that war in Gaza, which I had to go from Cambodia to Israel to negotiate uh, with uh, the Israelis, uh, the prime minister's security cabinet, then go to Egypt and convince then-President Morsi 
to go ahead and, and get it stopped with Hamas. Building a strong enough relationship with China, which was not just about the economy, but beginning to raise issues like human rights, so that when I let a blind dissident who escaped from house arrest into the American embassy, it didn't crater the relationship, but it stood up for American values. And and there are lots in the headlines, which you'll read about, but I also want to say a word about the trend lines, because a lot of people only look at the headlines and don't stop to think, what's going on below the surface? So I began the first programs to try to more effectively counter terrorist ideology, putting in place uh, a group inside the State Department that went, you know, point by point against al-Qaeda's propaganda, rebutting it, pointing out that, you know, the Islamist terrorists have killed far more Muslims than any Western power has ever done. And to begin to take that battle back to them, that they would have to be on the defensive. We also looked at how we were going to help feed the world, because, frankly, we're going to have too many people And with climate change, we're not going to be able to feed them. And so we started a program called Feed the Future to help farmers do a better job of growing crops, getting them to market, making a better income. Climate change, I write a whole chapter about the meeting that President Obama and I crashed because we were in Copenhagen trying to get a simple principle adopted, namely that developing countries like China and India also had to mitigate climate change. It wasn't just those of us who had built up a lot of greenhouse gas emissions because we developed earlier. And they were hiding from us. I mean, we couldn't find them. We were trying to find the Chinese premier, Wen Jiaobo, to have a meeting. And we kept being told, oh, he's on his way to the airport. He's not there. Okay, well, then let's meet with the Indian prime minister. Oh, no, he's not available. All of a sudden, you know, the president and I are looking at each other. Something's going on. So we sent out scouts throughout this big convention center in Copenhagen. Those those, those are the Chicago roots coming back. Yes, you bet. Something's going on. (laughs) Don't take it at face value. We're going to, we're on a hunt. (laughs) And they came back and they said, they're having a secret meeting in this secret place. And they have all the security around. So I look at the president. He looks at me and off we go. We called it a footcade. You know, we're, we're charging through the convention center, up the stairs, the Chinese guards are yelling, no, 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 or whatever that is in Chinese, I forget. Anyway, (laughs) and so, you know. it sounds so similar to that. (laughs) It sounds very Chicagoan, right? And so, the president, as you might remember, is a lot taller than I am. So, the, 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 you know, the Chinese guards are blocking the doorway, and the president just kind of pushes past them, and they're trying to block me, so I go under, and we show up, and... (laughs) This is an absolute. This is an absolute true story of how they found uh, like the secret meeting on climate change. Oh my God! It was it was amazing. And so the president said, "Hey, we've been looking for you." So we brought the potato salad. It was, yeah, that's right. Where's the potluck? So we 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 sat down. There's a picture in my book of us sitting there, you know, and, and we're looking like, "Oh, okay, let's talk." And they're all like, "Oh my gosh!" And but it was an important meeting because we did get them to agree to begin to take mitigating measures inside their own countries and report them transparently. Now, we didn't get anywhere near what we needed to do, and we're still working on it. And I am really proud of President Obama for these new EPA regulations and for the strong stands that he has taken on uh, climate change at home. (laughs) Crashing that meeting could be a book or a movie on its own. As a, another question, as a feminist trailblazer, what would you say to those who think feminism is something that happened in the past? Well, I don't think you've lived long enough yet. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I know there is this debate, but, but, but look in the dictionary. A feminist is someone who believes women should have equal political, economic, social, cultural rights. I don't see anything controversial about that at all. And and, and in the work, uh, Chelsea and I are co-chairing uh, a program at the foundation called No Ceilings, the Full Participation Project, because in 1995, at the meeting in Beijing, 189 countries adopted a platform calling for the full participation of women and girls. And we've had some progress. That's one of uh, the projects we're doing, is to demonstrate where we were and where we are today, and to show the gains we've made, but also the gaps that still exist. And it's fascinating to me, because in many parts of the world, women are still so denied. I mean, we have 
We have places in the world where they don't even register the birth of girls. So you don't even know how many girls are alive in that country. We have a lot of places that still kill girls or allow them to die. And so you have a big gap between, uh, in the same age group, men and women. And then, of course, we have denial of education. Or fine, you can go to primary school, but then you're done. So we still have a lot of places where there are these external barriers to women's full participation. But we also, in the developed world, like our own country, we have the internal barriers. We've done a great job knocking down the external ones um, that I can remember were still in place when I was growing up in Park Ridge. But now today, we have books like Lean In by my friend Sheryl Sandberg, who takes all the research and looks at the ways that boys and girls are treated differently and also really points out how so many of us women, and particularly young women, hold ourselves to an impossible standard, and the outside world does as well. You know, for the outside world, there is a double standard. How you look, how you dress, may I mention hair, I mean, all of that. And <laughs> for, for women themselves, we suffer from what I call the perfectionist gene. Does this sound familiar? Like, oh, I'm not good enough. I could never do that. I've employed, in the course of my now long professional career as a lawyer and, and, and in government and other ways, I've employed a lot of young people. And it's almost inevitable when I say to a young woman, I'd like to give you more responsibilities, I'd like to increase uh, your, your standing, give you a different title, etc., that a young woman will say, really? You, you think I can do it? When I say to a young man, it's like, what took you so long? <laughs> And I think there are still some barriers that we have to work on with each other because ultimately what we want is every person, man, woman, boy, girl, to live up to his or her full God-given potential. Uh, I'm going to read you the question as written by the audience member that slight related back to the earlier questions about economic statecraft, bridging foreign policy, domestic how can we continue to make America more welcoming to immigrants? And the, given the issue is both an economic and cultural one and all the cross currents, and it touches on, obviously, the election uh, yesterday in Virginia. Well, I am um, absolutely convinced, especially having traveled to 112 other countries and being able to look at our country from that perspective, that one of our greatest strengths is that we are a nation of immigrants and we would give that up at our peril. Um, I, I believe so strongly that uh, the negative attitudes about immigration and, and immigrants, which we are seeing played out in certain places in our country politically, are based on a gross misunderstanding. Um, I think that the bill that was passed in the Senate, which was a bipartisan bill, it wasn't an easy one to negotiate, um, was a fair compromise to begin to uh, set out the ground rules for immigration going forward, but also for caring for those who are already here. And I can only hope that this falls into the category, Rom, where we just have to have a more informed uh, ongoing conversation with the American people. You know, peop as I've read the, uh, the political coverage, and we just saw this race in Virginia where Eric Cantor, the uh, second-ranking Republican in the House, was defeated by uh, a candidate who basically ran against immigrants, and his argument was this. There are Americans out of work, so why should we allow immigrants into our country to take those jobs? And I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair question. But the answer is not to throw out of work and deport the 11 million immigrants who are contributing already to our economy. The answer is to grow our economy to create more jobs. And I, I spoke to a big food industry group here in Chicago, actually in McCormick uh, Place uh, last night, and they grow vegetables and they grow fruits. And they advertise widely for people to come work in those fields. There aren't many Americans who want to do that work. Now, maybe they should, so Alabama decided they passed a law which made it illegal to hire anybody but an American. And it was hard to get people to do that job. I mean, that's the way immigrants, they come in often at the bottom, they work their way up. 
and then they have education, and they have other ambitions. So I think we have to be very clear about where we need to focus on creating more jobs, but also focus on remaining welcoming to immigrants and making it clear that there are a lot of immigrants in this city today who are doing jobs that keep the city going. And we just need to have a more well-informed, fact-based conversation instead of the reactive, uh, negative uh, conversation. Another one uh, from the audience. What advice do you have for a 19-year-old who wants to change the world through government and public policy? Hooray! (laughs) Hooray! Whether 19-year-old man or woman... Thank you for wanting to uh, subject yourself (laughs) to this very difficult role in life. I would make three points. uh, And the first would be one of the best pieces of advice I ever saw about anybody who wants to be in the public arena was from one of my heroes, Eleanor Roosevelt, who back in the 1920s said, if you want to enter politics, you want to be in public, you have to grow skin as thick as the hide of a rhinoceros. You have to learn how to handle the slings and arrows, the criticism. And you also have to learn, and it took me, frankly, a long time to learn this, and I'm still learning it, um, how to take criticism uh, seriously but not personally. Because any decision you make, somebody's going to be mad about. I mean, just think, if you get 60% of the vote in an election, it's considered a landslide, that still means 40% of the people don't like you. (laughs) And they're not going to support you. And you just, you have to have enough of a um, threshold for pain and criticism, but you also have to know what you want to do it for. If it's only just because you want to be on the stage or you want to be given some kind of special treatment, that is not good enough because you cannot withstand uh, the extraordinary pressures of public life. But if you really believe that you want to help fight climate change or stand up for immigrants or you've got new ideas about how to create innovation and more jobs in the economy or close the inequality gap, that will keep you going. And that certainly is, has been my experience. We have time for one more question because I have this day job, which is I'm going to go to a, a swearing in for another class of police officers, which I know you would uh, respect. Yep. We're over 1,000. Earlier, you mentioned uh, the word compromise, mm-hmm. which is too often, too, uh, too often forgotten in Washington. Do you think in our politics today that's still possible to get the compromises like what was happened in the sense of the uh, balanced budget agreement or some of the other issues that uh, are children's health care? So is it still possible? Is the country as divided as they're saying or Washington more divided? And is compromise still possible in our political system? Yes, it is possible, but it's going to be hard to... Uh reassert it as a fundamental principle of a democracy. You know, without compromise, you don't have a democracy. You, you have people who believe that it's their way or the highway. Mm-hmm. You have people who um, point fingers uh, at anybody who deviates, you know, one small inch from what uh, the perfect is, who think they have a, a direct line to the divine, and that is not the way a democracy works. That's a theocracy. That's an autocracy. That's not a democracy. So I would make three quick points. First, don't vote for anyone who proudly says they're against compromise because they are fundamentally saying they are against the American experiment in democracy. And it is... It is deeply troubling to me. I see a lot of these people running for or holding office who are giving these stem winder podium pounding speeches about how they'll never compromise. They'll go to Washington and they'll get it straight and all of that. And that's not the way you solve problems. That's not the way you move the country forward. Uh, Going along with that is certainly don't fund anybody, don't contribute to anybody who proudly says that. But then I do think in Washington itself, it is not a simple task to try to find some common ground, but it is a necessary, never-ending task. Rahm remembers that, you know, when Newt Gingrich was speaker, he would go on TV every day and say the worst things about Bill and occasionally about me. Uh, And then he would sneak into the White House around 9 o'clock at night, come up to the third floor in the residence, and he and Bill would start hammering out compromises. Now, it got so bad from the perspective of his lieutenants that they ordered him never to meet with Bill Clinton alone ever again. (laughs) 
Because Bill picked his pocket every yeah. time. <laughs> but I, but I, to be fair to Gingrich, um, he did have a sense of history. He, you know, he, he unfortunately injected a lot of vitriol and, and negativism into our politics, but you could make an agreement with him, as you recall. And about, you know, trying to save Mexico from financial collapse, there was no support in the country for it, and Gingrich said, well, I sure can't support it. I'm going to go on TV and rail against it, but I'm not going to block it. So, yeah, that's what happens behind the scenes. Anybody who saw you know, Spielberg's great movie about Lincoln. Or I just recently saw in New York the play about Lyndon Johnson called All the Way that uh, uh, Brian Cranston was in. It is like making sausage, but that's human nature. You know, you got to give a little to get something, and you got to keep moving forward. And despite all of the challenges we've had in our country since its very founding, we've always managed to do that. So the 13th Amendment gets passed. Look, did it take, you know, maybe giving some people some post office jobs? It might have. But it ended slavery. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty good trade off when you stop to think about it. I'm going to say this uh, one, welcome home to Chicago. Two, this stage uh, is usually graced with the elegance of ballet dancers, and I would say it's never been graced like this moment. Hillary Clinton. 